I want to first say thank you to Matt Cleave for helping me get the set up because <laughs> I was a mess, so I couldn't have done it without him. Um, so welcome to my session, a case study, uh, creating accessible content for Lullabot's Iowa.gov digital transformation project. I have a link on there. If you um, go to that, you can get these slides and also the QR code will do the same, hopefully. So first up, I added this last minute. Um, it's bot stuff. I didn't have a better title, but these are two upcoming uh, talks uh, from Greg Dunlap and Aubrey. Uh, they are today, and they're great talks. And there was just another talk by uh, Matt Cleave, actually, that um, was in a smaller room, so there was a lot of people. Um, I would definitely recommend, um, so I'm saying I don't know a lot. <laughs> I would definitely recommend listening to the recording for it because it was on migration and I mentioned migration in this talk. So Greg Dunlaps is on designing content authoring experiences and then Aubrey's is on do you still need SAS in 2023. So I'd like to give a quick introduction about myself. Um, my name is Kat Shaw. I'm a senior front end developer at Lullabot and I've been over there for just over th uh, four years. I um, I added this little bit. Um, I am a co-owner since 2021 because we are an employee-owned company. I've been a web developer since 1999. That's a long time. A, a digital accessibility specialist since 2005. A Drupal developer since 2012. CPACC certified since 2017. And you can find me on all of the social networks at Kat Ann Shaw and also my websites, katannshaw.com. So next up, I'd like to go over what we'll cover in this session. So first up, we'll cover the project team. So that consists of the state of Iowa, QA testing team, and the Lullabot team. Uh, next up will be the project goals that we had. So what were the initial goals from the client and from Lullabot? Um, then we'll go over the project life cycle. So how has Lullabot incorporated accessibility throughout the project life cycle? Then we'll go over the project implementation. So how has Lullabot and Iowa.gov worked together to leverage Drupal accessibility modules and features for content entry? Then project outcomes. So what are some of the lessons that were learned and were the initial goals reached? And finally, hopefully, we'll have time for some audience Q&A and I hopefully can answer your questions. So first up, I'd like to um, give some kudos to the Iowa project team. Uh, first, the, the first slide is the Iowa team. So the two I have highlighted are the ones that started us off on the project would be Alex Murphy and Don Conant. This was the Iowa team from the beginning of the project, but there have been new people that have uh, jumped on since I left the project. Um, and then the QA team consisted of one person, Aaron Kronk, but he provided excellent QA testing throughout the project, and he's still on the project, I believe, right? Yep. yep. And then the Lullabot team that was on the project, there, and I hopefully I didn't miss anybody, but there's a, it's an amazing team. There's too many to mention by name, but I did add their screenshots on here with their names. Amazing people. I added mine just because I was on the team, but I uh, want to thank everybody for... Um, their efforts on the team, it was, a, it was an amazing product, uh, project. So next up, let's go over the project goals that we had. Um, what were the initial project goals from the client and from, from Lullabot? So the first goal was to create a project that meets accessibility standards. Um, the first um, accessibility standards we focused on um, was uh, the WCAG 2.1 Level A and AA. And first off, WCAG is an acronym for Web Content Accessibility Standards. And WCAG 2.1 standards were the published standards at the time of the signed contract, so that's why we worked on those standards. But we did um, incorporate the 2.2 standards in the preparation for it being published because it was obvious that it was coming up. And uh, WCAG standards are used for the front-facing pages of the site um, that, the that the users are going to see. Next up was the WAI ARIA 1.2 standard. So obviously a lot of people just know it as ARIA. So WAI is an acronym for Web Accessibility Initiative. 
and ARIA is an acronym for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And those are used for screen reader and non-mouse users. Then we have the ATAG 2.0 standards. So ATAG is an acronym for Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines. And that's used for employees and others who access the authoring tools like the admin Drupal pages. And I feel like it's skipped over a lot um, when people are developing Drupal sites. They, they really don't think much about the admin pages. Um, the Claro theme um, was put a lot of focus on the uh, WCAG and ATAC standards when they developed it, so that was great. And then finally, the revised Section 508 standards. So the Section 508 is the law in the US, and it applies to all federal agencies and those entities who get federal funding. And I believe that they're working on it applying to more entities, um, cities, states, counties, um, higher ed, and a lot of others. So that's going to be great. OK, next up was to create new Drupal 10 sites and migrate data from existing sites. So this is interesting because when we first started the project, we actually created Drupal 9 sites for two sites initially, iowa.gov and governor.iowa.gov. And Matt, as he talked about in his um, talk just before this one, um, and his team, I believe, was Hawkeye involved in that one? So Matt, Hawkeye, um, uh, uh, okay, performed a data migration of existing Drupal 7 sites, but we didn't create, we didn't have to, like some people have to do more with the Drupal 7 sites, we just created new Drupal 9 sites. We created a customization tools for the admin users, so that included a color palette selector under the configuration and a layout builder um, customization for home and landing pages. We cloned the new site for other batch deployments, so all the sites are independent of the rest, but they share the same configuration. So an example of that would be that they have the same content types and views. And we added Okta implementation, so that's for single sign-on. So Okta allows the client to connect their employees with any um, applicable application on any device, sorry. And finally, we upgraded the Drupal 9 sites to Drupal 10 when it was ready. So the final initial goal would be um, to create storybook component library and single directory components. So um, with the storybook um, component library, we set it up um, specifically to be used for the non-Drupal sites. So there was some sites on .NET Nuke, but there was there was sites in a lot of different platforms that were not Drupal, and we had to take that into account when, whenever you're working on a, a government uh, like a higher ed or you're working on a state government site, you're gonna to have to deal with that. So we use the HTML version after a lot of thought on Storybook instead of React to make it for, uh, future, the, ma the future maintenance easier for the client developers. And the library was created so that they can use the same styling and accessibility features of the Drupal sites. We also incorporated an early version of single directory components. So uh, we created the reusable components that each held a Twig template, you know, YAML files, so metadata, JavaScript, and CSS styles. And in this case, we used SAS. So sorry about that, Aubrey. We imported and rendered these components within our Drupal site using Twig files. And I'll, I'll actually show an example of that later. So next up, I'd like to talk about the project life cycle and how has Lullabot incorporated accessibility throughout the project life cycle. So uh, accessibility was incorporated into every step of the project life cycle. Uh, first steps with strategy, they had workshops, usability testing, wireframes that they um, showed the client, and they used planning uh, for strategy, obviously. Design um, had Figma designs with a focus on accessibility from the beginning with annotations with, um, they included all of the um, like focusable elements and I'll talk more about that. Development, backend and front end development of sites using storybook and single, single directory components with mandatory automated testing on PRs using Tugboat. QA testing, so quality assurance testing focused on usability accessibility, coding standards, and the client's expectations, which were always, we always had meetings to make sure that we were meeting those. 
the client training and content entry. The client training on new features and content entry of real data with, was, with a focus on doing so in an accessible way was a huge part of this because you know if you have bad inaccessible content, it doesn't matter how accessible of a site you write for a client, it's going to have bad inaccessible content. And finally, the deployment, um, which was scheduled deployments of batch sites using GitHub Actions that incorporates automated testing. And of course, project management was at the center of everything throughout the whole process. So first up with strategy, as I mentioned, they had the workshops, they had usability testing, they had content planning, and we also started something um, that was regular cross-functional meetings. So we had these at least twice a week meetings with the design team, the strategy team, and a senior front-end developer um, discussing how to meet accessibility needs of users amongst other things. And I um, went ahead and volunteered to be that person on this project so that all of our front-end developers didn't have to go to all these meetings. Um, and I found that it to be really helpful for me to understand like the overall picture of what we're doing at every step and then be able to communicate that with the front end and eventually back end teams on the project. So this picture here uh, shows an on-site workshop and card sorting with the strategy and project management teams. And here's another picture of an on-site workshop with the strategy and project management teams. And this right here is a data dictionary planning of content types. So in this case, it's at a landing page content type. And we had one of these data dictionaries for every single content type and actually uh, micro content types. And it contains all of the fields and additional notes for the entire team. Um, it also allowed for color coding when changes were made to the fields. And this was very, very helpful for every level, um, for the development team, for the strategy team, I mean, it just it was a it was a lifesaver. It really was. So it was a, a good source of truth. I loved it, and I appreciate Marissa for giving me lots of links to them whenever I needed them. So it was very very helpful. Thank you, strategy team. Next up, the design team. So the design uh, system um, had reviews by the accessibility subject matter expert, and in that case for this project, that was me. Um, so we would, um, they would just ask questions and, and we would go over them and luckily um, in Lullabot's case they are very um, forward thinking on accessibility so we don't really have to go over too many things but sometimes you know there's things that fall through the cracks and, and we just you know find a solution for them. Annotated designs were very helpful. Um, that's something I highly suggest you talking to your design team about because you know, one person's view of how something should work is different than another's, so I, I really highly recommend them. There's definitely a lot of plugins for all of these things, by the way. You don't have to create them on your own, just use plugins. Use of Figma accessibility plugins, as I just mentioned. Focus behavior for all focusable elements. Having that, um, I'll show an example of that on one page, is great. Accessible color options. Customizable color palette. Light and dark modes target size and spacing styles, and font and heading styles. So this screenshot here is showing a color accessibility um, setup in Figma that they had. So for us, it's easy, easy to understand because you can see the annotations at the top on the left. And they also had clearly defined color contrast settings for the color palette. So if you notice on here that the uh, red X is there, that shows that those are not to be used for the focusable elements on the site because they don't meet color contrast. And this is a light and dark mode um, screenshot. So you can see that light and dark mode was considered with the theme, including the logo. And that actually wasn't easy in this case because you can see the logo, the O on the logo has uh, the green and it has like a road and it has a sun. So trying to get that worked out with light and dark mode was not easy, but they, they did it and we tested it. And um, for me, this is really important because I have a sensitivity to light and I use dark mode on a daily basis. And so um, it was really important for me, but I, I knew that a lot of users use dark mode. So that was really great. 
focusable elements in Figma design and implementation. So all focusable elements like buttons and links have their default hover and focus states defined in one easy to find place. So here you can see it's applied on a page navigation and cards. The top is the main navigation right there and you can see that and on the bottom is or the, the visual uh, link collection and on the on the left of the side of the screenshot on the top we have this the CTA links is a button style you have regular links and this whole page has all of them with the default hover and focus states very very helpful for a uh, developer to go into this Figma file pull the values for everything and then make it work here we have color branding and color palettes so the color branding and palettes have their CSS names outlined clearly, making for easier development. And they also contain user-friendly names for clients and color-coded values like the hex value on every color. And a selected hue that was accessible when it comes to color contrast. So it's kind of hard to see, but some of them are highlighted and that made it easier for us as developers to know which ones to use for the site and which ones to just use for you know, decoration as long as it wasn't focusable. And here's the color palettes actually implemented on the theme. Um, so you can see it in action. So this is the same page and that department. Well, this is a sample, but you could see how each element changes just depending on the color palette. So next up is the development, and I'm splitting this up into backend and frontend development. So the backend development had regular deployments with GitHub Actions, continuous integration with Playwright, Zap Security, and Lighthouse, load testing, and quality control through peer review and GitHub. So for that was for best practices and coding standards. So here's a screenshot of a PR build with automated tests. And this build shows Playwright functional tests, renovate tests, lighthouse tests, and zap security scans. And this happens on every PR before it can be reviewed. So if it fails, you have to go figure out why it did and then get it and then make it go through. So, And then on the front end, we had accessibility testing with development with storybook component integration, single directory component module integration, we followed the accessibility standards I mentioned at the beginning. We did browser testing with extensions, magnification, act step tools, etc. We did web-based testing with color contrast, bookmarklets, readability, etc. We did operating system testing with screen readers and color contrast tools on the desktop. We did Drupal testing with modules, features, and configuration. We did tugboat and automated testing of PRs as I showed, including now they have Axe and Lighthouse they're configuring in there. And we did quality control through our PRs just like the backend team did. So this screenshot here shows a storybook page header component with a blue background and, uh, and an image. And you can see the accessibility plugin that is added to storybook. So it shows it has zero violations, 14 passes, and one incomplete. And you can see um, with the highlighted 14 passes, you can see each criteria right there. And if you click on each one, it actually opens up and shows you the details of, of the criteria. So this one here is the same um, component, but it's with a gray background and no image. So it's just a variant of the page header. And again, you see the accessibility results in this component on the bottom with all of them highlighted. This here is a screenshot of the YAML file that holds the page header content. And so here you can see that it's defined on the top of the title, stories, name, and the arguments. And each um, component is within the, uh, the name and the argument. So the first one would be with all content, the second with image credit only, and you can add as many as you want with all of the different uh, variables in there. If it has an image, you add it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's, it's amazing. It's really, really cool. This one shows a Twig uh, template, a uh, Drupal Twig template, 
that's pulling that component in and displays, in this case, it's actually a basic page that displays the page header. So it's kind of, I had looked at this and I was like, I don't see the page header, but what it's actually doing is it's showing all of the content on the page without the page title and it's actually showing the page header on the site. And this is it implemented on the basic page. So it has the page header, it has the content, and it has the sidebar on the page. So that's, a, that's it implemented on this page because for this page it has an image and it has a title. For other pages, they don't have any image at all. And actually, you'll notice on this page it doesn't have a caption under the image, but if there's a caption, it'll actually show a caption. And if it has a credit for the image, it'll show a, a credit. Okay, uh, next up is QA testing. Um, with QA, they did ex used accessibility tools, the same as development. They did screen reader testing, keyboard testing, color contrast testing, code testing, and they also used the same tugboat automated testing on PRs. So here, right here, is a screenshot of, uh, with tugboat, we have uh, data first testing, and you can review environments within a serverless platform. It's a wonderful tool. I highly suggest you check it out. So in this case, you can see a lighthouse integration of an accessibility report, which runs on every PR build for every page configured when it's um, integrated. If um, there's errors, you just open that tab there, and it shows that, all of the errors, and it has screenshots for each um, error on the page. Here is a screenshot of a playwright test. Um, it shows, in this case, it's testing whether or not keyboard tabbing works properly for the page's navigation. So you could see, um, hopefully, it says arrow down, arrow down, tab, tab, and, and click, and it has all of that there. So it's trying to act like a real user going through the, the page navigation. Here's a visual diff on a, the main navigation. So it has three screenshots links on the bottom, so diff, actual, and expected. And each screenshot has a slider that you can move to the left and the right to show the before and the after. And um, next up is client training and content entry. So content entry training we did for different roles. So we really focused on meaningful alt text for all media. Uh, when I say that, that, that's what I was talking about earlier. Um, let's say you have a picture of a, of a field of sunflowers and somebody puts sunflowers. Um, a more meaningful text would be um, large field of sunflowers or something like that. Or if somebody's standing in the field of sunflowers and they just put sunflowers, woman standing in the middle of a field of sunflowers, you really want somebody who is blind and cannot see the image to feel like they're seeing the image. You really want them to, to understand that. So meaningful alt text is very important just as much as adding alt text to an image. Logical heading order, um, don't skip headings. Um, a lot of people use uh, headings, they think of styling when they use headings. You can use CSS for styling the headings. Make sure they're H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, and if you use H6, which I don't know many people that do use H6, but make sure they're logical. Um, the next one would be plain language and readability. I mean, it's, it's important for people, especially with cognitive dis disabilities, but honestly, it's important for regular people that don't have, I'm not, not regular. It's, it's important for me. I, I like to go to a page, I like to have bullets, I like to have simplicity, and I like to be able to navigate through a site and not have to read a big blob of text. And that's important. There are a lot of really great uh, tools out there. I'm drawing a blank on the one, but I mean, for readability, you can copy a bunch of text in it. Hemingway? Hemingway, yeah. Um, so just, just use it for readability. Layout Builder for home and landing pages. Uh, we created, uh, we use Layout Builder for the custom home and landing pages. And that was a really great on this project. Um, and we taught them how to use it. Um, we also had a rich text editor for embedding content. And in the, both of those cases, they added components from the single com um, directory component and from Storybook. They also did office hours for editors and agencies, which was really important. They still do, right? Yeah. So content audits and migrations and content type best practices are focused. Um, that's what they focus on in there. And they also provide documentation to clients on how to use the site at each step. So for each content type, micro-content type, different things 
create good documentation. So here's a screenshot of Layout Builder with custom section layouts. This image shows how users can add an, any configured component to the page with Layout Builder. This admin sidebar has layout section options with white, light, and dark background colors. With that selection, everything else also changes on the component automatically, including the font color, icons, etc. So for instance, in this case, it's a blue background. Um, automatically, the text turns white. The part in the middle, that all changes. If this was a light blue, then it would turn dark, all the text. And that, I mean, it's, it was not easy to set up, but we did it. <laughs> um, it also detects the background color of the hero and switches the first section to background color if, the sa if it's the same color. So that was not easy either, but we got that done too. This is the rich text editor with content type selector via entity browser. So the user adds components to the rich text editor. Um, this includes an option to align media to the left, right, and center. And this uses the same components used in Layout Builder, so they're shared, avoiding duplication. Here's a color palette selector tool that I, um, I was showing the front of what, how it's actually implemented. This is the back end for the admin users. So it's set up under the custom configuration section, design settings. And the theme uses CSS variables to change the colors of the theme depending on the selection. So they just need to go there, click it, and boom, their whole site is a different color palette. Okay, so I'd like to talk about the deployment. So initial deployments of Iowa's governors and state of Iowa's sites were the ones we focused on for the initial launch. Then we had scheduled batch deployments of Iowa department sites using GitHub Actions, and still do. We deployed a dev test in prod environments twice a week, and the sites use one code base with no config differences. Did I get all that right? Awesome. Okay, so here's a screenshot of GitHub Actions deployment of Iowa sites. This image shows a deployment of several Iowa sites using GitHub Actions. And you can actually see the workflow for each department over here. This one here is a drill down of that same uh, deployment. And this specific one is for the governor.iowa.gov. So you can see how GitHub Actions works. And it's very, very cool. So thank you for uh, providing me with that screenshot. Next up, um, I'd like to talk about the project implementation. So how have Lullabot and Iowa.gov worked together to leverage several, Drupal's accessibility, several of Drupal's accessibility <laughs> features for content entry? So the first thing we focused on using, of course, is Drupal Core's modules and features. Um, we, we used CK Editor 4 initially, and we're actually um, integrating CK Editor 5. So that's coming soon. And these are all linked in the slides, so um, if you want to check out any of these that you haven't heard of before, you're welcome to check them out. The next one is inline form errors. I'm not sure how many people know about this, but it's actually um, in core, I believe, but it, you have to enable it. I wish it was like standard and you don't have to enable it because it's an amazing uh, module. What it does is, for forms, it adds the errors right under the fields in red and it actually highlights the fields, the outline of the fields and turns them red when there's an error. It, it provides all of that for you. Um, it makes it much more usable, um, more, much more accessible and it, sh it really should be standard on every site. The next one is the media library. Um, the reason that that is key to accessibility and usability is because it's structured content. You're not um, having, you know, different links, different places, you're, you're having everything in a concise order, everything is structured like I was talking about, being able to have a, a easy to read page. Um, the responsive image and breakpoint uh, modules we use, both um, also must be enabled in core. Um, that's great mostly for the mobile users, um, being able to have um, the mobile image, load in mobile, lap, uh, tablet, desktop, and not have a huge image load in mobile is very important. And you'd be amazed at how many um, users nowadays are actually using their mobile devices exclusively as opposed to using desktop. So I think uh, people really need to focus on that because mobile and tablet devices are, especially for younger 
um, the younger generation is really the way to go. And then views and views UI. Um, so that is really helpful. The big thing is for when you have a view and you have a list of news items and you have that client that has to have the read more link, they just have to, and you know read mores are not accessible, so you go into the view and you just, you're able to uh, change the output and you're able to add an ARIA label that says read more about title, the title token. And when you do that, it makes the read more link accessible to screen reader users and they're able to use the read more link. It's best of both worlds, not, not ideal. It's better to not use it, but if you have to use it, sometimes you have to negotiate. Okay, next up is Drupal contributed modules. Um, the first one is, and features, I'm sorry. Uh, the first feature is ARL alerts. Um, so it's used by screen reader users, and it's a JavaScript uh, method providing announcements, ARLI, so by creating ARIA, ARIA live elements on the page. Next one is easy breadcrumb. So that provides configurable path-based um, breadcrumbs. Um, embed, entity embed and entity browser, that's the one that allowed us to add components within the uh, layout builder and um, rich text editor. External links adds an external link icon and screen reader users, when they get to that, that it says open a new window to links. Layout builder, um, I've already talked about that, but you're able to create pretty cool visual layouts. And then Drupal contributed modules, uh, link it, very great uh, for rich text editors to be able to have a consistent link on different uh, pages. Menu block is great um, for structured content. Path and Path Auto has um, great user-friendly URLs for different pages instead of node slash one, two, three. Um, single directory components, we talked about that a lot. Style guide's great for, for development because um, when you have your main theme, you might have your admin theme and you have other themes, you're able to actually um, load all of your elements in one page and test them for accessibility using your different accessibility tools. So you wouldn't want to use that in production, but that's great during development with your theme. And then TOC API and TOC filter was just recently added on the top of every basic page where it has the headings in a list and then those link to the headings and then a back to top link. Okay, next up some uh, other suggested modules and features. So block ARIA landmark roles as ARIA landmark roles and other ARIA labels to your blocks. Block class adds CSS classes to your blocks, and so that allows you to avoid inline CSS. Context storage um, used, is used in concert with the contact module, so it allows you to store the um, data that people submit, and it gives them an on-screen notification. And then twig filters. Um, so there's some Drupal specific twig filters that allow developers to modify the variables in twig templates, render arrays. And um, those were very helpful. And um, Hawkeye actually helped develop those on a few projects I was on. So the project outcome, what were some lessons learned and what were the initial goals, what initial goals were reached. And I know we're kind of getting there, so I'm going to hustle up. Um, first one, too many, too many mandatory meetings were counterproductive. Uh, solution, marked many meetings as optional, chose one team member from each discipline to attend, cross-functional meetings were the golden ticket for a great project. Second one, client requested non-accessible audio files as embedded media content. Um, I performed an analysis, figured that it would, they would each need transcripts. The client at the time decided not adding them was a better choice, and I don't know if they ever did add them, but they, at the time, they decided they would wait and add them in the future. Uh, unifying agencies to a single platform means authors lose custom functionality, and that was a big thing that they talked about. But there were benefits of the centralization that included better security, lower maintenance and upgrade costs, shorter time to launch the new sites, and more consistent editorial tools resulting in reduced training burden. And so initial goals reached. Uh, create project that meets accessibility standards. So all of the accessibility standards continue to be followed and maintained by the Lullaby, by Lullaby and the clients. It's always going to be something. It's a moving target. You're always going to make sure you're keeping up with it. Now that WCAG 2.2 is official, we're working towards implementing that, those standards as well. 
create a new Drupal uh, 10 site and migrate data from existing sites. We launched Iowa.gov and Governor.Iowa.gov on January 10th, 2023, just in time for the Governor's State of the State speech. And that's a, a press release from it, and we actually got to, uh, several of us watched it live, so that was pretty cool. Create new Drupal 10 sites. Uh, the second one would be migrating and launch several new Drupal 10 sites with regular deployments using GitHub Actions. So here's the first screenshot of all of the sites, second screenshot, third screenshot. So we are at 20 and counting, We're doing great. And create storybook component library and single directory components. We did that, both of those, so for non-Drupal sites, there's several non-Drupal sites. And additional con uh, goals reached, the color palette tool and the home and landing pages using Layout Builder. So let's see, we're at 11.50. I was supposed to be done at 11.45, right? I think you're done at noon. What? Yeah, noon. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just open these up and ask to say, see if anybody has any questions. So I'll just do this and demo. This is the Iowa site. Yes. How easy was it to ensure that the sites were also accessible on the mobile devices? We we actually really focused on a mobile first approach when we were developing, and so um, the first approach, uh, the first thing was the designers created a mo uh, different breakpoints like a mobile and a desktop for every single design. So that was really important. And then when we developed it, we really, you know, within the SaaS and stuff, we always focused on a mobile first approach. So when we tested every single thing, we, we really focused on that. All of the um, automated tests also include uh, testing for all of the different breakpoints. So there's a lot of different um, ways to check for that and also the QA testing. So I think that having different layers um, was really important um, and also different developers. Um, the peer review is also super important with that too. So you're welcome. Go ahead. What was your the base theme that you started with? Oh gosh, that's was it a question. Bootstrap or something? No, else? we we didn't use Bootstrap. Um, I don't know if we, because this is when uh, what was it? Classy got moved out of Core. So okay. yeah, that's a good question. What about the the card like this four card? Is this uh, coming from Bootstrap? Is it using the cards? No, we actually use CSS Grid. So, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, so uh, CSS Grid is really great. It, it could be a pain sometimes, like, oh my gosh, uh, but it's really amazing what it can do. Uh, and we did use CSS Flux for the stuff inside, so. But it was a custom theme. Okay. I'm, I'm just not sure, I don't think, I think we used Stark. Isn't Stark the one that has like pretty much nothing? No. I think we decided to go with that to have as clean of a theme as possible. Yes? Yeah, I was curious to see if the cross device testing, how you would handle that. The cross device testing? Um, so, are you? do you mean for uh, browsers or do you mean for. I mean actual devices like Android versus iPhone and compatibility. Sure. We did a mixture of emulators and actual physical devices. So, luckily on our team, we have people that do have Android, iPhones, um, ta different kinds of tablets. Um, we actually have people that have Windows devices. So, uh, but again, with the um, automated testing, it actually does a lot of that too. So, with the, with the different layers, so real people and QA testing, because the QA was huge for that. He's, he's uh, what Aaron Kronk was uh, the one that really focused on that mostly, but we did that with emulators and, and um, real devices as well. So you're welcome. I, I highly recommend automated testing to catch those kinds of things and having a QA, at least a, one person, to be able to focus their attention on that. Uh, go ahead. Did the client ever ask to make the back end 508 compliant like a uh, Node ad page for their editors? Did they, uh, did they ask for what? I'm did sorry? To make the back end like a oh, Node okay. ad page. Did they ever ask to make that area? You know. It, the 508 was not actually in the contract. Um, I 
just included it because they are they are a state, and that's the law. And so when we <laughs> Uh, and one of the good things is if you look at the revised 508, like the original 508 was a, it was a pain, but when they did the revised 508, they matched their standards to the WCAG 2.0 standards, and so it makes it a lot easier. Even though they they have different names, it makes it a lot easier to be able to um, do. <laughs> um, I did a VPAT recently, and I did a like for everything, like 508 international. It was not easy. But the biggest problem was actually just figuring out what letters go where. But they all use WCAG 2.0. It's just a lot of copy and paste. So, yes. This might be a bit of a silly question, but you mentioned a dark mode for the site. Mm -hmm. How do you turn on the dark mode? It's interesting, because I'm, this is, uh. So, <laughs> I'll show you. This was interesting for me during testing. It drove me insane. If you go to your, so for a Mac, you go here and you go, now I'm going to draw a blank. We don't see the browser. Oh, shoot. Okay. Do I do it here? I don't think it's going. Come on there. You can do it. Actually, maybe I can. Look. Is it something you have to turn on in the Mac setting? Yeah, probably. I'm just trying to drag it, but it's not dragging. If you go to your settings mm -hmm. and you go to, sorry, display, mm -hmm. I think it's in display. Yeah, I don't know. I'm having one of those days right now. The accessibility, appearance, that's what it is. If you go under appearance, there's a light, dark, and auto, and that'll change your system. But that does not mean that all sites respect dark mode. I found that out. So what I use is a, um, let me try to go back to here. I use this handy thing called dark reader. So this is great because you can, it, it automatically will put dark mode on a lot of sites. Some sites you can't. But then you can go here, like if you're, um, oh, let's, let me do this. Switches dark mode, and then you can add sites to exclude right here. And then you could toggle it on and off like I just did. So if I go like that, you can see it in dark mode. So, but um, when I was testing, I had my system in dark mode, and I had that in light mode. And I spent like a week trying to figure out why it, why my CSS dark mode wasn't working. And so please remember that. Go ahead. Um, can you talk more about this color palette tool? Is that a custom color feature? It is, yeah. We, um, we used uh, CSS variables and we have like a, a, a folder that has the different palettes. And so using the same color variable names and then just changing the color values for each one. Um, and then it just switches it depending on which one they choose. So it's a custom built thing, but no, I, I think it'd be pretty cool to contribute back, honestly. And the slide that was showing like the front end, which was the actual like uh, palette mm -hmm. screeners, yeah. that is generated by the site? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you just, is it available to the public or is that just in the back end? That's just in the in the code base, yeah, yeah. Yes. That was specific um, image alt tag question. Could you scroll back to the cards? Sure. Hold on. Um, Let me take it out of. Or, um. So yeah. Oh well, not these. Uh. That were the. Uh, not these. Anyway, that was the. Uh, that was these right here. Mm -hmm. So. I used to, I'm a Drupal developer, front end, and yeah. I would write alt text, so I would write photo of a bird. Yeah. But our QA team told me not to use the word photo. Yeah, don't, yeah. And, and I understand the logic. Yeah. But on the third, would you use the word drawing? Like, when is it okay to use some meta description? <laughs> I, I would never use like anything that has something of. I would never use graphic of, photo of, image of because 
the screen reader is going to say image before every single image. So you're going to say image of, photo of, or image, actually image photo of on every single image, and that gets really redundant and stuff. So for this third one, it's a coin, and let's see, what is it, Iowa State quarter? I mean, I would probably say the same thing that that says, Iowa State quarter, the U.S. Mint, or something like that, um, because that's what it really is. Um, so I wouldn't say photo of or image of or anything like that. This is the Iowa flag, right? So the Iowa State flag. Um, the state tree, This I wouldn't put state tree. I would actually probably, this is the oak. So I would put the, you know, oak tree, you know, state tree, the oak, or something, you know, I'd find something that's pure readable. The mnemonic tool I was given for doing this was take, say, say the words imagine, and then drop the word imagine, but imagine, a coin, mm -hmm. Iowa, 19, 1846, Foundation Education. Imagine Iowa State flag. If you just say anything you would say after the word imagine, that works for That's great. Yeah, I like that. And this one would be like a yellow, and I don't even know what kind of bird, state bird, so, you know, goldfinch. So, and I don't know, if, I guess goldfinches are all always yellow, I'm assuming. <laughs> So uh, it's time. I'm sorry. Okay. It's, did you have a, one more question? I do, but it's a developer question. I can pop yeah. up and ask if you want. Yeah, to let's do that. Okay. Yeah. And can you just share the links on the slides? Yeah, yeah, I could do that. Um, quick, 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 quick. Well, thank you for attending. Uh, I hope it was informational. And I have some links at the end of the slides uh, for credits for people that helped out. There you go. Sorry about that. Okay.